Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would like to now turn the meeting over to your moderator, Jennifer Major from Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon everyone and thanks so much for joining today. So Mary Beth um, is going to be with us as a guest host. Mary Beth, could you just check out the chat um, on the screen and just dial the number um, that Kelly and Sheena have provided just so that you can participate with us verbally today. Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, for today's webinar uh, is the second webinar in CFHI's new discussion series, Community Dementia Care and Support. So we're pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation on today's webinar. If you'd like to see the presentation and hear the presentation in French today and you've not yet been transferred, please let us know in the chat box on the bottom right of the screen. Once you've been transferred, you'll need to shut down your computer speakers and dial the number on the screen. We also invite you to use our chat to insert comments and questions at any point using the chat box in either English or French. We'll reserve verbal discussion of comments and questions to the end of the webinar, but encourage all of you to respond to comments and answer questions in the chat as you wish as we go along. Also a note, we will summarize the chat questions and comments after the webinar and translate to both official languages so we can share this in a post-webinar email with you. and that post-webinar email is also going to include links to the recording for today's webinar. So thanks everyone for answering the lobby poll that was there. That really helps us to know who is with us today. So thanks a lot um, for doing that, putting your vote in. All right, so participants for today's call. We have 387 people from across Canada who've registered, and I see people are still joining now. It is the noon hour in Ontario, and people are just seeing this pop up in their calendars, so it's great. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to share a territorial land acknowledgement of where I'm presenting from today in Ottawa, which is where I live. This acknowledgement is meant to recognize the traditional territory of Indigenous people who called the land home before arrival of settlers. CFHI's head office in Ottawa is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And my hometown of Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, which is pictured on the left, is in traditional Mi'kmaq territory. I acknowledge and respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Biotic, Mi'kmaq, Inui, and Inuit of my hometown province of Cornerbrook in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I encourage all of you to share in, in the chat the, the box, uh, chat box the territory and land that you're joining us from today. So our CSHI team is pictured on the screen. That's me in the middle. I'm the host for today. Tanya McDonald and Jessica are also support uh, to this program. For our presenters and moderators, we have quite a few people today, and I will be turning to them to actually introduce themselves briefly. So first, I'm going to turn it to Karen, who will provide just a brief introduction of yourself, Karen. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm Dr. Karen Chen. I am actually an assistant professor at the University of Alberta, and my background is that I'm a care of the elderly physician, so family medicine plus another year uh, of training in care of the elderly, and I'm very excited to be here. Great, thanks. Um, and Helen? Provincial practice lead with the Seniors Health SEM. I have a background in social work and community engagement, and I'm excited to be able to share about our initiative today. Great, and Mary Beth, I know that you're still trying to dial in. If you haven't been able to yet, the number there is in the chat. Uh, but Carrie, introduce yourself. professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo, and Schlegel Research Chair in Dementia at the Research Institute for Aging. So I um, am primarily a researcher looking at health services and engaging people with dementia to improve care and care experiences. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And Mimi. 
Becky Lowe Young, and I'm the chairman of the board of directors of AgeWell, which is a network centers of excellence bringing together researchers from across the country to look at innovative solutions, technological solutions to aging well and for people with dementia. And I'm also the former CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and now I'm a senior fellow and adjunct faculty at the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Mary Beth, I think we have you, so please introduce yourself. So my name is Mary Beth Whiteton. I am uh, 53 years old, living with a diagnosis, this uh, probable frontemporal dementia. And I'm the co-chair of Dementia Advocacy Canada at Roots. Roots grow in an organization of both care partners and people living with de uh, dementia. In addition to that, I am part of the federal ministerial advisory team. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Canada's COVID task force and part of the World Health Organization for the uh, uh, looking at uh, material for their uh, Global Dementia Observatory and a few other things. That's good. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from all the presenters today and our guest moderators, Mary Beth and me. So the objectives for today's webinar, we're going to provide a short overview of our Community Dementia Care and Support webinar discussion series. We're going to talk about, we're going to turn it to our presenters, so Karen and Helen, to talk about an innovation based in Alberta that's improving dementia care and support in the community in that province. And we're talking, Carrie's going to share some information about a research initiative that she's helping to lead called Cognizance. And we'll also facilitate discussion around the potential to spread these innovations and other innovations to improve care and supports in the community for people living with dementia and care partners. So CFHI is an organization that's well, our building is actually based in Ottawa, but we're all working uh, virtually right now. We're, we're a not-for-profit organization funded by Health Canada. And our mission is really to collaborate with partners to identify and spread proven innovations that improve health care and support closer to home and community in areas of shared provincial, territorial, and federal priorities. So the impact of our work is really meant to be lasting improvement in patient, family, and caregiver experience and health, work life with providers, and value for money. And we do this always in partnership with others, with others, and where we can add value is central to our work and vision. So about our webinar series, we are in this series going to discuss emerging and demonstrated innovations that are going to aim to improve timely, compassionate dementia diagnosis and primary care and post-diagnostic supports, including coordination and navigation. So you can check out our web page where we have more information about our series. And if you, have, if you know about an innovation that we could consider for promoting in this webinar series or pr consider supporting to spread across Canada, you can use that email address that's on the slide, bbd-dmc at cfhi-fcass.ca, and tell us about that innovation. And the other thing we're hoping you can do is spread the word about the series. So the registration link is there as well, again, as that email address. So for your consideration today and throughout the series, we're, we're wondering from you what promising innovations exist that we can spread across Canada within the current health context, which is you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. What's the feasibility of your organization, your province or territory or community to implement and spread these innovations now? And what would it take? Like how could CFHI add value to support you to spread or implement those innovations? And what are the partnership opportunities? So we know there's a lot of organizations attending, um, people living with dementia, advocates. Um, what, what can we do together to really make sure that we support this? And one of the things we're going to ask you about today is whether you're interested in attending some one-on-one -on -one calls or actually group calls to actually talk further about what we can do and where CFHI can add value in this space. 
So I am right now going to turn it over to our guest moderators um, to talk a little bit, just, just to provide some personal and uh, reflections about our series. Um, so over to you first, uh, Mimi. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, maybe I'll ask uh, Mary Beth uh, the question about uh, what matters to you regarding improving dementia care and supports in the community? Thanks, Mimi, for that uh, uh, question. Um, I, I was actually struggling with trying to answer it because I, I do believe that there's many number of different things that we can do to improve uh, dementia care and sports in the community. And I, I want to kind of just take a second and think about really um, that question in a COVID type of uh, environment that we find ourselves in. And so one of the biggest things to improving dementia care and support um, focuses in at the support at home. And we know our care partners are being um, slammed by the lack of ability to support the care partner and people with dementia. So we need to start to look very quickly at how do we support people at home, both the person with dementia and the care partner. And the struggle too then becomes when we're looking at support, then it becomes a question of navigation. How do we actually navigate to that care, through that care pathway um, and um, find that coordination of, of care support? And we hear loud and clear from our care partners that, um, I mean, we always have actually, this has been a, an issue for a long time, but now it's even louder. We are lacking the true ability to find the integration of care pathway. So if I'm a local person in my local city, my, my services have been shut down, there isn't any 1-800 number, for instance, to go to and say, how can I get that, that care? Sometimes there are provincial or territorial um, um, support, but not a coordinated national support. So again, in particular through the COVID um, uh, pandemic, that's a very, very big one. And then it's almost like it's a chicken and egg. Um, how do you get to that if we do not improve the training for health care? Because we have to make sure those individuals have the best care of or best, um, best understanding of dementia and care partners that they can. So it, it's definitely a chicken and egg in it. Um, I think those are some of the most important ones. And uh, I'm going to hand that then over to you, Mimi. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mary Beth. And I, I think navigation is, is a huge issue for individuals in terms of how to, how to get access to services. No, no question about it. And you know, having 13 healthcare systems in Canada, every province does it differently, and their focus on community care is different, and how people actually access community care is 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 somewhat different uh, across the country. Uh, and you're right, there isn't one national way of, of, of doing it or nationwide way of, of doing it. Uh, and we need to be much better in terms of integrating and, and supporting people and navigating based on what their particular needs are because individuals have different needs and they need to be able to, to access uh, services based on what, what, what they feel they need um, in their journey. So I think, yes, and I think COVID has highlighted, uh, COVID-19 has highlighted to us where the gaps really exist in the system, where the dependency may have been on long-term care facility, um, but that people really do want to stay in their home and help and they do it. And that leads me to the question about how can technology help people living with dementia in the community stay and live um, at home uh, for, lo for longer periods of time before even considering uh, long-term care. So I think what's happened with COVID is that we have uh, highlighted and uh, have had greater access to the whole idea of virtual care, um, where before governments really didn't want to discuss it. And now people are saying, well, this is an option. So just on the care side, there's an opportunity. But really, innovative technologies offers, offers a real benefit for the aging populations and those living with dementia and their, and their care partners. 
Um, the opportunities for innovative technology to be used, um, for example, in improving social isolation, physical wellness, even predictive abilities of diagnosis of dementia, uh, enabling self-monitoring of health, and promoting appropriate treatment. So examples of, of technology which already exists and have been worked on through uh, the organization that, that I chair, AgeWell NCE, uh, which stands for Aging Gracefully Across Environments Using Technology to Support Wellness, Engagement, and Long Life. That's what AgeWell stands for. Anyway, we, we bring together a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research uh, team, teams from across the country. And they, for example, will give you a technology that's been actually uh, created and needs to be sort of spread and scaled. Um, for example, telehome care, locating technologies, wearable and motion sensors, smart home systems, uh, intelligent scooters, digital games, and much more. The only barrier sometimes to some of this is, is in relation to the, um, the issue of um, um, privacy legislation, reimbursement, and procurement. So those are just some small issues that we need to overcome to be able to adapt and scale technology. That's my point. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Mimi and Mary Beth. Um, Mary Beth, did you have any reflections to Mimi's comments? Well, I think Mimi really does uh, bring home uh, excellent examples of what can be done um, when there is a focus on, you know, these particular gaps that we're speaking about. Because it is technology and it is innovation that is going to move us forward. Um, and, and that's particularly important when we're talking about policy, for instance. Um, you know, if, if we don't have the solutions then um, creating policy around, you know, non-solutions doesn't really make sense. And so, um, you know, really, really Mimi's uh, bang on about uh, the desire, one, of people wanting to stay at home and the many different technical solutions that can be done to help us stay at home and, live, uh, you know, live a good life. Thanks so much. So, yeah, so hopefully there's areas where CFHI can help to add value for that, like looking, you know, convening provinces and territories to look at the various privacy legislations, et cetera, policies that can be put into place to support some of these technologies, not only to help people, you know, have the proper care, but also the proper supports in the community to, like you say, live the best life that they can um, following a diagnosis of dementia. So really looking forward to more discussions about that. So right now I'm going to pass it over to our speakers from Alberta Health Services. And I believe first up is Karen. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. And uh, Helen's actually going to go first. Thanks, Karen. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity to present the Primary Healthcare Integrated Geriatric Services Initiative, or as we say, Big Z. To simplify our message, we are using the phrase connecting people and community for living well. Uh, this initiative has grown out of work done by the Seniors Health Strategic Clinical Network at Alberta Health Services. I'm going to provide some background information and then I will pass it over to Karen. Next slide, please. Thanks. You can see the progression of FIGSI across the timeline since 2016. An evaluation of that pilot phase has been completed, and based on learnings uh, from that phase, we're continuing to develop our understanding of the role of community coalitions in this work through a Health Canada grant. The focus of FIGSI is on supporting those living in the community who are impacted by dementia. This is achieved really through two levels, provincial and local level. The provincial team provides and shares, develops and shares a vision and framework with the local teams. Those local teams, who are comprised of local people from all sectors, health, social, and community partners, come together to understand, plan, and then build new supports. These new partnerships, which includes a meaningful engagement of people living with dementia and carers, creates an increased understanding of everyone's role and reinforces their commitment to being action-oriented. This has resulted in the improvement and creation of new local supports within their existing resources. 
So why is working together seen as innovative? It seems really intuitive, but in reality it is really difficult. The systems are complex and usually siloed. The cross-sector, grassroots approach of this work, in particular, necessitates intentional efforts at both provincial and local levels. Over the past, last few months, we have heard from the participating teams that they have been greatly impacted by COVID-19. They continue to express enthusiasm about the FIGSI work, and they have been reaching out to their communities through online meetings. Next slide, please. Here is the FIGSI Anticipating the Future Framework, and it reflects the 2019 World Health Organization's description of primary health care as a whole of society approach to health and well-being centered on the needs and preferences of individuals, families, and communities. FIGSI focuses on level one, which is the primary health care team, and this is at the community level. We know that most people will continue to live in their homes as they age, and this means that we need to develop supports at the community level and that there needs to be a focus on both vertical integration and horizontal integration as seen as those, in those arrows. The language of vertical and horizontal integration comes from work done in the United Kingdom by Glasby and Dickinson, and it recognizes that complex needs often span both health and social care, as well as that boundaries in providing services are organizationally drawn and often don't foster an approach that best supports the individual. In terms of the vertical integration, it's the one that we are most familiar with in healthcare. It's a focus on building relationships with health sector partners, including doctors, home care, and mental health, to recognize and compassionately diagnose dementia. Activities have included education on dementia, appropriate prescribing, multi-complexity, and the implementation of individualized care plan and improved clinic flow processes. The arrow along the bottom, the horizontal integration, is the area of innovation in FIGSI. The focus here is on building new supports in the community by bolstering the partnerships between local health, social, and community partners. This includes people living with dementia, carers, family and community support services, the Alzheimer's Society, and municipalities. Activities in this area have included development of support, support groups, memory cafes, and adult day support programs. The base of the pyramid is the foundation. Relationship building across sectors is key to understanding the local context, and this has been the work of the community coalition. These concepts of vertical and horizontal integration have really helped the local teams understand what streams of work are being pursued, who is leading it, and who was involved. Next slide, please. On this slide, the messages and diagram were developed by carers of people living with dementia. This work was developed um, and supported by the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories as part of the Advancing Dementia Assessment and Management Conference in 2016. And although these messages are fairly well known now, they were innovative at that time. The message within the diagram that people living with dementia and carers do not want to be in the center of the circle, they want to be equal members of the team reinforces that meaningful and responsive support is based on partnering with the intention to build awareness and better serve unmet needs, that planning is based on identified needs, not assumptions, and the notion of better together, that each person builds on the strengths that each member brings to that team. The, these have been guiding principles for the FIGSI work. I will now hand the presentation over to Karen. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of more detail in regards to our initiative, and Helen's done a great job of telling you guys the base principles of it. Um, I want to talk about the partners that are involved in our initiative and uh, we see as um, key partners. So uh, Helen has mentioned the provincial team. We are a small um, but mighty uh, uh, that that has really um, building and we work with the local communities in regards to helping these communities um, create action plans. Um, we help them develop new skills uh, in regards to making um, changes within the community or building uh, resources that they uh, need. And this is all really led directly from the local teams. They decide what they need, and the local 
uh, teams are the experts in terms of what uh, can happen within their own community, what the needs and the opportunities are. And we work very closely um, with the local teams. And within each of those teams, uh, a lead or champion is identified. And typically, uh, in the community that we're working with right now, uh, this would be a nurse uh, working within primary health um, who is very much aware of uh, the system within that local community. And uh, within uh, and with that start, uh, the community start building community coalitions, which I will talk a little bit more about. But really, these coalitions are representatives from diverse organizations within community who agree to work together to achieve a common goal. And in this case, it's to support people living with dementia and their care partners. Um, and another key partner within our initiative is actually subject area experts. And the subject area experts are not just the healthcare professionals or academics. Um, we have uh, many people living with dementia and caregivers. Um, and just like the slide that uh, Helen um, went over, that it was created by caregivers to give us guidance um, in terms of what, what needs to be created. Um, and we are very grateful to all of, our, all of our subject area experts to provide the education and coaching um, in order to uh, make things, things really happen in these communities. Um, and this the little quote on the bottom there is from one of our um, caregivers talking about how it really is essential that it's not just um, the medical care team that was needed for, to help support him um, and his wife who was living with dementia, um, but it really was um, everybody in the community and it, it really takes a village uh, to make uh, make this work and to you know, help patients who are uh, people living with dementia and their caregivers. I'm going to move on to the community coalitions. Um, and what I really want to say about this is that it's that diversity um, and inclusivity of uh, all players within the community are so key. And within our uh, community that we're working with, each community has a very unique makeup of their community coalitions. I think that um, as a baseline, there's always uh, a representation from the healthcare sector as well as the social sector, se social services sector. But some of them have um, been able to engage uh, so that members of the municipal government are involved. Uh, certainly the members of the public, people living with dementia, and their caregivers um, are involved in these community coalitions. Um, and one of our communities who I see is on the line here today, um, you know, they've coined the phrase that the weirder the mix, the better the fix. Um, and what the communities are finding is that they actually are, are work, by working together and creating these relationships, they're able to not just work on uh, this their, their goal of uh, helping people living in Cheney with dementia and their cares, but it's actually helping them solve other problems as well. So the, um, this slide that I put in here, we just wanted to highlight that we have done an evaluation in the initial pilot phase uh, of, of our initiative, and we've seen good results um, at different levels, um, as well as we've done an economic analysis. And this has been um, good evidence that's led us to uh, receive uh, getting more funding, and as I mentioned before, as well as continuing our work over time. And really, in terms of what uh, we what has, has come out of the initiative, we wanted to point out that there's many new supports that did not exist in these communities before. Um, and the sustainability of this initiative is actually uh, very good in that we're not um, that we're using resources that are already in the community, but they're simply, perhaps we're not working together. Um, and to, you know, it, it, by working together, they're actually being able to create more resources. Um, and here are just some of the examples uh, that we've listed under new supports. And I think that it's very key that those collaborations, for example, the Community Adult Day Program that was built in one of our communities, it was highly reliant on uh, having that uh, and work, work together with the municipality who helped provide the transportation, working with the healthcare sector that provided some of uh, the, uh, the staff for the daycare program, um, and then with uh, also the community partners who provided actually the location uh, where the, the day program could take place. And that's just one of the examples uh, that uh, we've gone through. And you know, there's so many more. And, and I think that uh, we, we'd love to talk about more of it as time goes on with you guys. Um, with our initiative, we really have uh, been working on this for the past five or six years, and we're at the stage where we're continuing to develop the community coalitions, but also looking at spread and scale across Alberta. Um, I wanted 
we wanted to put this link to a video to introduce you further to Figsy. We'd love to have played the video for you, but it's uh, four minutes and would have taken a good chunk of our time. But this is really um, highlighting in one of our communities in Innisfail um, how the initiative uh, has helped perhaps uh, the local community develop resources. And it's from the point of view as well of a couple, um, and a person living with dementia and uh, his care partner. Um, so we hope that you guys will look into that uh, after our seminar today. Um, and the next point, we just wanted to mention that we have been lucky to receive a Health Canada grant um, to continue our work and actually further develop and do more research around um, what are the real benefits uh, of this work um, and continue our work overall. Um, and we're very excited uh, to uh, hear any questions from this point, and I'm going to leave it off from there. Uh, it, it, stop there at that point, um, but we we are excited where we're taking this work and uh, more and more communities have become uh, interested uh, in joining this initiative over time. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Helen and, and uh, Karen, for that presentation. So we are going to open it up for questions shortly, but before we do that, so I would encourage people to type in the chat right now if they have any questions. Um, for the previous presentation, but while we wait for those questions to come in, we're asking you to answer this poll. So would you like to participate in a call with CFHI um, to learn more about the FIGSI innovation? And of course, our FIGSI presenters um, and potentially others uh, from that work would be part of that call. And what we'd really want to be able to discuss with you is what, you know, would your community or province or territory want to actually look at implementing that innovation in your context? So, you know, are there things that you'd want to, to learn from them? Is there something CFHI could do to help um, bridge that connection, essentially? And we would talk about supports, including potential funding. The second question is, prior to the webinar, were you aware of this innovation? So as I mentioned earlier, we are trying to raise the profile of innovations we know are improving people's ability to live in the community for longer following a, a diagnosis of dementia and that support for the care partners as well. So we wanted to know the answer to that question. And the third question is, I know more about FIGC than I did before participating in this webinar. So um, that's just a question that we um, we actually report that back um, to our funder, Health Canada, um, so, but not with names attached or anything. So we'll just give you a few seconds to answer uh, those that poll. I don't see any questions yet coming in. If I don't see any questions, um, you can maybe some of our um, other speakers might want to, uh, like Mimi or Mary Beth, if you want to offer any reflections. But otherwise, what I could do is just um, go on to carry. So let me just pause for 30 seconds or so, give people a chance to type in some questions, and we'll be right with you. Uh, the question, <laughs> what, what barriers um, did you find uh, in, in implementing um, this uh, project um, that you found in, in implementing, what, what were some of the barriers and how did you overcome them? Karen or Helen, would you like to answer that question that Mimi just asked? Definitely. I, I think that um, how I'm going to add to this, but there have been um, many challenges, uh, definitely at the local level um, as well as at the provincial level about, um, I think, um, getting people on, on board. And, and one of the big things is that people say um, that, uh, you know, you're getting sectors to collaborate or breaking down silos, but isn't that, don't we all work together anyway? And and that's the biggest barrier. that the truth is that, uh, unfortunately, we are incredibly siloed, particularly within healthcare. And I think that um, getting that, um, getting that buy-in and, and making sure that people um, know that it's actually very important to work specifically on um, that collaboration across very, very important, and I think there's been many challenges at the local level as well uh, in terms of uh, getting buy-in and uh, in engaging partners, and uh, certainly there are many, uh, many, and I don't know if Helen, you want to add some more into there. 
Yeah, I, and I guess I would just, on the positive side, in terms of the local level, what, what we found is that actually a lot of these partners had not met each other, and it was through the provincial learning workshops that they um, came together and, and realized that they were both um, you know, both uh, sets of services were actually engaging with a lot of the same people, and so they could see the advantages right away with that. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's time. Also, it's often on the sides of the of those workers' desks that they're doing this work. So I think having designated um, uh, resources for it has been has been a challenge for them also. Yeah, I think one of the biggest issues is just lack of knowledge of what's actually available, and that's that holds people back because they say, well, I didn't know, know you existed kind of thing. So this, this is great. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just put a comment in the chat too that, you know, one of the things and the hopefully the value adds that CFHI can do is actually compile information about barriers and enablers and the policies that work to support, et cetera, and then share it with interested communities, um, provinces and territories. So I see a few other questions have come in, um, one from Cindy. I'm going to actually hand it over to Carrie to have her pre presentation, then we're going to come back to your question, Cindy, after, um, after Carrie's presentation. So I'll turn it over to Carrie, and we'll get back to Q&A shortly. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And uh, thanks to Helen and Karen for a great presentation. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to participate in the webinar today. I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that we're doing um, that's called Co-Designing Dementia Diagnosis and Post-Diagnostic Care. And of course, the acronym is COGNIZANT. So this is an international study. And the purpose is really to try and en enhance or improve the experience when people receive a dementia diagnosis and then the supports that are given after that diagnosis is made. And to do this, we're going to be working directly with people living with dementia, with family care partners, and with health and social care providers. So it's very much a, a practical, you know, on the ground type of study where we're really trying to make a difference for people living with dementia and their families. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to work um, with a wonderful group of colleagues in Canada from Quebec and from New Brunswick. And we're hoping that after the study is done that we'll be able to spread this innovation. Next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to diagnosing dementia, we know that the experience is not always what we would like it to be. Um, and in fact, there are many, in many countries, some individuals don't even receive a diagnosis. And there's been some work, um, actually, could you go to the previous slide, please? So there's um, been some research um, that has looked at um, how many individuals do not even receive a diagnosis of dementia. And uh, in Canada, there's been some uh, studies that have suggested that you know, up to 70% of individuals with dementia have not received a diagnosis. Next slide, slide please. Um, and when a diagnosis is, is made, we know that it's not always communicated um, to the individuals. So while most family physicians and specialists do tell the family about the diagnosis of dementia, relatively few inform the, act, the person themselves. So there's been studies that have suggested that it may only be about one-third of family physicians and about half of specialists that actually share that diagnosis of dementia. And we also know that when it, that diagnosis is communicated, the experience may not be optimal. Um, so the person may be left without really any hope at all. And there may be few, if any, post-diagnostic supports that are um, recommended or given to the individual to help them cope with their, their new diagnosis and also to help them support uh, living well with that diagnosis. So people are often left to sort of fend for themselves. Next slide. So Kate Swaffer is a person living with dementia from Australia, and she coined the term prescribed disengagement. 
And this describes her experience when she was diagnosed with dementia. So essentially, she was told to sort of go home, stop doing what she loved doing, and to just wait for the disease to progress. Um, but fortunately for all of us, um, that's not what she had done. She's become a wonderful advocate in the dementia world. Next slide. So we wanted at this point to um, ask you just two quick questions for uh, a poll. So first is whether you have um, encountered um, or if you are aware of an encounter when a de dementia diagnosis was less than optimal. And second, um, if you are aware of an, an encounter where post-diagnostic support were not given after a diagnosis of dementia was made. So I'll just give folks a few minutes, well not a few minutes, a few seconds because we don't have a lot of time to respond to that poll and we'll see, we'll see what comes out. I think people are still responding, but um, I think we have unfortunately two clear winners. Um, so yes, people are aware of situations where the diagnostic experience was less than optimal and post-diagnostic supports were not given. So we'll go, maybe we'll close that and go to the next slide. So these, um, you know, this knowledge and even the experience you can see from folks that are around this this phone and computer uh, webinar right now, um, they really provided the impetus for Cognizance. Uh, because unfortunately, these are not experiences that are just happening here in Canada, but they are happening around the world. And so um, a number of us from Canada were uh, had the opportunity to participate in this um, um, you know, great opportunity for uh, an international study that's being conducted in Australia, Canada, UK, the Netherlands, and Poland. And so this Cognizant study, the aim is to develop toolkits and behavior change campaigns that hope to improve the diagnostic experience and post-diagnostic care experience for those living with dementia. So the campaigns and toolkits they're going to be co-designed. So we're working together with people with dementia and family members and providers to first identify what are the key goals, what are the key things that need to be done to improve that experience, both during a, di a dementia diagnosis and following. And uh, what are the key messages that need to be you know, put out to others? So the toolkits then, what they'll do, you can think of them like a toolbox. So well, there'll be a, a, a number of tools within the toolbox to help support people living with dementia and families and providers to achieve the goals that those with dementia have identified. And then the campaigns, those will be um, the way to get the messages um, out and to help promote new behaviors. So we want people to do different things because of you know, the work that is being done here. And so we'll have a toolkit and campaign that's targeted at members of the public and a toolkit and campaign for providers, so both um, healthcare providers and social care providers. And obviously those things need to be aligned because we, we want um, you know, the public and providers to be speaking sort of the same language with each other. So I think it's important to highlight that we are in the early days of this work. And in fact, we are still just confirming what our uh, specific goals will be for the toolkits and campaigns. But just to, to give you an idea, I'll give you an example or two of what these might look like. So for example, uh, you know, as I talked about earlier, we know that um, supports at the time of diagnosis are not always given to individuals. So if, if we hear from people with dementia and their families that, you know, there need to be resources, there need to be things that are done to really support people to connect with you know, some of these key resources after they get a diagnosis of dementia. So if that is a key goal, then 
for example, the toolkit could provide resources on how individuals might be able to advocate for those resources. So it could be um, resources to help them know who to ask for support, what questions they should be asking individuals to you know, optimize the support they'll be able to obtain, and then also resources on how to find those, resor uh, those supports that are available and how to navigate um, the system. So that, those would be examples of things that could be in the toolkit. The campaign then would really focus on that message of the importance of post-diagnostic supports and encouraging people to go to the toolkits and use those resources to advocate for the supports that they need. So that would be one example. Um, another example, if folks with dementia tell us that you know, they struggle with communicating, telling other people about their diagnosis. And obviously that's key to be able, being able to, to get some support. So in that case, um, a toolkit might include resources to help people you know, know how to share that diagnosis with others. So sharing that diagnosis with family members and friends, um, with maybe children or grandchildren, and also to how to share that diagnosis with healthcare providers or social care providers. And then the campaign could focus on, you know, the importance of communicating um, a diagnosis and to listening to individuals, for example, who are trying to, to share their experience with you. So just a couple of ideas. As I said, we're still in early days. We're still confirming what those key areas of focus will be for the toolkits and campaigns, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a, an idea of what those might look like. Next slide, please. So this is a, just a snapshot of our team, and, I, and you know, I, I'm really quite humbled to be able to work with some very amazing individuals. Um, we've got some collaborators, particularly in Australia and the UK, who are, are really world class. And um, in the bottom right corner, you'll see that we also have a number of international representatives. So as I mentioned, Kate Swaffer earlier, who um, really work to develop Dementia Alliance International. We also have um, representatives from the World Health Organization and from Alzheimer's Disease International. So it's a, a very exciting group. And we are hoping not only to be able to share our learnings and the uh, toolkits and, and campaigns that get developed um, within, for example, within Canada and within the other provinces, but also with other countries. Um, and with a particular focus on low and middle income countries because they uh, you know, just do not often have the resources to be able to do this work. So what can we do to kind of help them along the way? Next slide, please. This just gives you a, a sort of a snapshot of where we are, we're at. Um, we've been conducting surveys and focus groups just to get a sense of where um, what the experience is like in each of the countries related to that uh, dementia diagnosis um, experience. And we're currently working on the development of the toolkits and campaigns. Uh, after that, we will be um, delivering those campaigns and disseminating the toolkits and conducting an evaluation. And then, as I mentioned, working on some resources to help um, share the, this uh, this innovation across to other regions of Canada and to other countries. Next slide. So, and here is just some information about how to get involved. So, if you're interested in, you know, participating in a survey or an interview, um, particularly individuals living in Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick, or if you're interested in receiving updates about the project. Uh, I've given the uh, contact information of Melissa Cook, who is a research coordinator, and uh, she can, um, you can reach out to her and let her know what you might be interested in, and we would be happy to share information with you. So thank you very much, and look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Carrie. And I do see there's some questions coming in. Um, before we get to the questions with Carrie um, and also with our other presenters, if everyone can take a few moments and answer our poll. So would you like to participate in a call with CSHI to learn more about Cognizance? Um, please answer that question. Prior to this webinar, were you aware of Cognizance? 
yes or no. And I know more about Cognizant than I did before participating in this webinar. So that third question we report back to our funder with no names attached. But um, if you do answer yes that you'd like to participate in a call, we will be sending out more information about how you can do that in the next um, two or three weeks with people on vacation, et cetera. So thank you so much for answering those questions. So we do have only about 10 minutes left. And what we're going to do is, I know there were some questions that came in. Um, there's been some discussion in the chat around you know, what CFHI could do to support um, physician education, so creation of CME credited um, education that could be um, provided to or with physicians around early diagnosis and post-diagnostic support. There is also a question that maybe I'll take it back. Um, so Cindy, and then we'll turn it over to like kind of a general question while people um, put some questions in for the presenters. So Cindy actually asked, and I'm just looking for the question. Um, so um, is there an, oh, that, that, there's a, there was the one question about the opportunity for involvement of patient partners in the Cognizant work, so I think that's been answered. Um, but she also asked, I think, earlier about, um, does anyone have a solution to be able to reopen adult day programs? So this is a vital community support for care partners that has been shut down since COVID. And one of the responses that I put in was, I don't know if anyone knows kind of different provinces and territories and what they have been able to do to reopen programs like that or what their plans are, and wondered if CFHI could provide value in actually bringing some of that information together to share on a platform such as this. So maybe, um, I don't know if Mimi or Mary Beth, you have a comment around, you know, what we can do to actually open up those community support services so that people get the care and support that they need. Jennifer, I think that's the uh, $64,000 question that you're asking. Um, and there, there's... You know, I think uh, a lot of us are think, trying to think about what is the best way. Some example that I've seen is just simply uh, a social distancing um, for people coming into uh, that type of a setting. Um, is it hard to do that? Yes. Um, but people are, are doing that. So um, there's an example in Alberta, and I can't think of the name of it, but um, they, they seem to be doing a good job about getting back to that. Um, Mimi, do you have any thoughts around that tough question? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, both building the, the you know, the, the right things around uh, social distancing, but also using virtual um, opportunities um, where I think people are, who feel comfortable with the technology being able to exploit that to the, to the greatest extent possible. Um, I think there's there's some opportunity there, um, but I think over time, just as we're thinking about opening up schools, opening up care centers and and support groups and so on that are so important for keeping people well in the community with with the diagnosis of dementia, I think will need to be played out, and um, it'll be important for the regional health authorities and and so on to really push that uh, with regards to getting those facilities opened as soon as possible. But safely and, uh, you know, safely is, is the most important, I think, we need to keep in mind. Um, Jen, I have a question um, about uh, physician involvement or, or diagnosis and the countries that are involved. Um, direct question, um, do not some of these countries actually have a quota or have set a target for di uh, diagnosis of people with dementia? That I have. I have no idea um, if people have, or if there's any of those targets that have been set. I'm not sure if any participants on the line know of that, or even targets for diagnosis within your provinces or territories. Um, I know, Karen, you had mentioned that in Alberta, and I knew this, there's quite a bit of success with the CME credit courses for physicians, but... 
Yeah, I, what I was actually yeah. mentioning, Jennifer, is that um, as part of SIGSI, we do a lot of um, physician education because that's been one of the, the asks from the local community. Um, and honestly, uh, usually lunch is provided by, I don't know who actually uses the local community. Um, and the physicians show up and there's no CME credits. Um, and it's always a matter of debate, I think, amongst physicians whether or not the credits make a difference. They do. They're, they're more tempting, I think, for physicians to come. But it's not the key component for why they come. And part of it is, as well, because we engage more local experts into it. It's developing those relationships so then they can also they know who in their local area or who they can reach out to and it's more than just the CME part of things um, and the credits aren't everything. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, we're just thinking that, um, and it was just an idea that was kind of posed if CFHI could add value, like even to offset some of the costs for the, to take the course, um, just anything we could do to further incentivize. Um, people to take that, but I agree, like it's worked really well for us in the past too to really have support physicians to co-create education with people living with dementia, care partners, other people, but then the physicians are also playing a lead role in, you know, reaching out and mentoring their peers essentially when they deliver that education, but CFHI has a platform that we could use and we could support kind of the technical aspects as well as like potentially some of the funding of it. So just wondering kind of in the short term, because I always think of things as kind of what could we do in the short, medium, and long term, and I mean, the ideas coming in today about, you know, how can we open up those supports in the community, like the respite um, adult day programs, et cetera, like, and I see people are sharing information, so Lisa um, Rayner has shared that some, you know, day programs have opened up in Northwest Territories. They've been doing it a little bit differently than pre-COVID, so a limit of 10 people indoors and up to 25 outdoors. But if we could share some of that information to maybe help those services open up earlier in other provinces and territories where it may not be yet, like, could that be a short-term thing that CFHI could do in the space of, you know, making sure that we're supporting people living with dementia and care partners in the community. So thank you so much for your ideas. We only have a few minutes left, so we'll keep your comments coming. And then I'm just going to like clue up the presentation here just so we get our survey in. And then I'll, I'll turn it over for final reflections from Mimi and Mary Beth if we have a chance for that. So I just wanted to just give, this slide will be available after, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but we do have a program that you may be interested in learning more about, which is called our Priority Health Innovation Challenge, and that's really focused on mental health and addictions and home and community care. So check that out on our website, and again, this slide will be available um, post-webinar, so you can see that. And then I'll just go to our, our post-webinar survey, but and so it's a few questions for you to answer, um, and then in the meantime, if, uh, so if we'll just pull up that survey, I'll read out those questions. Um, overall, I was satisfied with my webinar experience. Overall, I was satisfied with how I was able to actively participate in the webinar. And very importantly, we have an open-ended question. Do you have any comments or suggestions to improve the content shared in this webinar? So, you know, the types of things we're also looking for there is, you know, we really are at CFHI interested to work with our partners who include, you know, Mary Beth and Mimi as advisors, as well as many others that we've heard from today and see on our call today to really understand where CFHI could add value to help you in the short, medium, and long term, do things in your communities to support people living with dementia to live at home for longer and to live well at home for longer. So let us know your ideas. Is it like, um, and what do you want to hear about? Do you want to talk about certain policies? Do you want to hear about um, different innovations that different provinces and territories are doing? Um, et cetera. So just give us your ideas, and we really would, uh, would like to hear from you. So Mimi. Any final reflections from you? Or Mary Beth, any final reflections? Sure. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for attending today's uh, 
webinar. It was uh, very interesting, and I think it provides us with a, a base of great understanding on some of these projects going forward. And the big thing that uh, sticks out for me is, of course, the word community. This, you know, these two solutions definitely look for the word community. Um, that's what they're basing their supports on. And, and, and then I think that just rolls up into um, uh, Kai Hai's uh, um, report on dementia in home and community care. And uh, they stated there that about 61% of seniors with dementia in Canada live at home and they require support while staying there. And that's not including an early onset number. So I think uh, it, these two projects, uh, it will be interesting to see how they, they move forward. And um, uh, thank you to the presenters. Jan, I was on mute. Sorry about that. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, just to say excellent presentations. Encourage. Um, uh, if the, the international project can, can look at their timelines because what they're doing is so important that we need it, you know, sort of yesterday. And um, the community program, I, I think what, what's being done is, is excellent and I think we need to look at every opportunity for modeling some of the ideas that have come out of that to spread and scale this, uh, the first project. That's it. Great, thank you so much. Well, it was a great discussion. We'll look very carefully at the chat and really look forward to connecting on an open call where more people will be able to share comments, um, et cetera, outside of the chat even. Um, have a great afternoon, and we really look forward to talking to you on this series, the next webinar, which is in August, or sorry, September. Talk to you all later. Thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.